Post-Christmas blues. Christmas 2019 is over. Now, I know Brother Ed says every day is Christmas Day, but officially Christmas 2019 is over. Uh, the tree may still be up, but uh, it looks a little scarce underneath. The presents are all gone. All that's left of the turkey is probably just a skeleton of the turkey, probably not still eating it. Visiting relatives have left to go back home. Yay. <laughs> and uh, things have changed. Christmas Day is over as far as the celebration is concerned there. The excitement of Christmas took weeks to build up. Remember that? All the excitement of, of, uh, to build up to uh, a large festive event on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. All of the decorating that was done, all of the shopping that was done, all of the baking, all of the shopping, all of the cooking, all of the shopping, all these things that led up to Christmas Day and then it's over and life gets back to normal, whatever normal is for your life. I, uh, a lot of people suffer from the post-Christmas blahs. I read this in the paper just this week. It was in the comic strips. And there are two children who are walking down the road in the snow. And one of them says, I can't believe Christmas is already over. The other one says, I know, right? And then the one says, all the preparation and decorating and then poof, it's all over. And now, it's all got to come down. And the other kid says, right, I'm exhausted just thinking about all the work my mom has to do. <laughs> but that happens, doesn't it? There's kind of sometimes a depression after all the hoopla of Christmas. The post-Christmas blues, and that's the title of the message this morning. But think what it was like for Mary and Joseph. We spend weeks before Christmas preaching about Mary and Joseph and all the events that led up to the first Christmas, including the birth of Jesus, but we seldom hear about what happened after Christmas. And we're going to see about that this morning. Some people don't consider Joseph a very important person in the Christmas story. The Bible never records anything that Joseph said. Do you realize that? No quotes from Joseph at all. If you want to have a part in a Christmas play, play the part of Joseph because there's no speaking parts to Joseph. If you want a non-speaking part, that's the one to play. He's usually ignored. The emphasis is always on Jesus, as it should be. But the emphasis is also on Mary and upon the wise men and the angels and the shepherds. And even the innkeeper has a speaking part. But there are no songs about Joseph like there are about the wise men and Mary and the shepherds and Bethlehem. Joseph is kind of left out of Christmas, in a way. I mean, what do people say when they see somebody on the street or see them in a store before Christmas? You say, have a very merry Christmas. Nobody ever says, have a very Joseph Christmas. It's always Mary. She's the key person in the Christmas story other than Jesus. And usually when we refer to Mary and Joseph, we always talk about Mary and Joseph. But what about Joseph and Mary? No, it's always Mary and Joseph. But God chose Joseph just as much as he chose Mary. And God chose Joseph out of all of the men on the earth. And this morning, Joseph and Jesus are going to be the central character. Mary and Joseph's life, excuse me, Joseph and Mary's life, is going to be turned upside down. It's going to be turned topsy-turvy. Nothing would ever be the same again. 
Now Luke, when he writes, he sums up the next 12 years after the birth of Christ. He sums up the 12 years in just two verses. It says in Luke chapter 2, So when they had performed all these things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. But Matthew gives us a little more information about what happened after the birth of Christ. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. Turn in your Bibles, please. We're not going to have the scriptures up on the screen this morning. I encourage you when you come to church to bring your Bibles. Matthew chapter 2. And in verse 13, Matthew chapter 2, verse 13, this is what it says. It says, Now when they, that is the wise men, had departed. So this is right after the wise men. As soon as the wise men had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother. Flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Now the wise men came, and they came with the three gifts that are mentioned. There may have been more than three gifts. There may have been more than three wise men. But the three gifts are mentioned, and they are presented to Jesus. And then when they leave, Joseph and Mary go to bed, and Joseph has a dream. Now this isn't the first dream that Joseph has. He has several dreams. While an angel always appeared to Mary when she was awake, an angel appeared to Mary and told of her forthcoming pregnancy and several other things, but the angel always appeared to Joseph when he was asleep in a dream. If you look at chapter 1 and verse 20, it says, but, uh, And behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And then you look in chapter 2 and verse 19, and it says, Now when Herod was dead, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And then in verse 22 it says, but when he heard that Archelaus was reigning, uh, he was warned by God in a dream. Always in a dream. Now Joseph was probably older than Mary. Some people think he may have been around 30 or 35 at the time of the birth of Christ. He was an older man and maybe like a lot of us older folks we take a lot of naps and uh, Joseph was asleep a lot. And so the angel came to Joseph always when he was asleep or napping or whatever the case may have been. Anyhow the angel tells Joseph in the dream to flee to Egypt because Herod is trying to kill baby Jesus. Look at verse 13 again. Chapter 2, verse 13. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And Joseph didn't waste any time. He didn't wait until the morning. He packed up right then and there, right now, that night, and headed out to Egypt. And think about what this meant for Joseph. He and Mary had traveled to Nazareth from Bethlehem expecting to stay just for a few days. They were going to go and they were going to pay their taxes and then they were going to go back to Nazareth. They expected just to go right back, but they didn't. They hadn't planned on moving lock, stock, and barrel. Their family was back in Nazareth and their family didn't even have a chance really to say goodbye to them. They didn't bring a wagon full of their furniture and their valuables and their furnishings. And Joseph may have had a carpenter shop back there in Nazareth that he left. What happened to his carpenter business? I don't know. But they came to Bethlehem and they stayed for a long time. And in the middle of the night, God said, move. And Joseph doesn't argue with God. He didn't ask God if there was a plan B. He didn't wait to figure it all out. He immediately obeyed. Maybe that's why God chose Joseph. Over all the other men in Israel, maybe that's why God chose us chose Joseph to be the father, the stepfather of Jesus. God knew Joseph's heart, that Joseph only wanted to know and to do the will of God. Look at the second thing here, God's provision in verse 11. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child, that is the wise men, with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold and frankincense and myrrh. 
Now, when God calls, God provides. Amen? God provided for them. God wouldn't have told Joseph and Mary to go to Egypt and then say, okay, you're on your own. Good luck. Have a good time. Do the best you can. God provided for them. And they would need some money. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They would need something to live off of while they were down in Egypt. And God provided through the wise men. But then we see Herod's anger, number three, Herod's anger. Look at the end of verse 13. And stay there, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And then in verse 16, Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Boy, talk about post-Christmas blues. This happened after the birth of Jesus. This isn't usually included in plays about the Christmas story. We leave this part out, don't we? Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus are now running for their lives, fleeing the country, and hundreds of dead babies are going to be left behind. It's not part of the perfect Christmas picture, is it? We don't see this on any Christmas cards. It's not a hallmark moment. The Christmas card industry, they stop at the wise men and, and they don't have any cards for after the wise men leave. It's not a Kodak moment. Let's take a closer look at Herod. Herod was after baby Jesus. He wanted to kill the Christ child. Herod was a mean and a vicious person. History tells us a lot about Herod. It's not in the Bible, but history tells us these things. Caesar Augustus was quoted as saying that it would be better to be King Herod's pig than his son. What did he mean by this? Well, pigs were protected by the law, but Herod's children weren't. He was a bad dude, a bad guy. He had a rap sheet. This is his rap sheet. He killed two of his own sons. He had them strangled to death. He also killed one of his ten wives, his favorite wife as well. Why did he kill his favorite wife? Well, he had ten. He killed his favorite wife because he thought she had been unfaithful to him. But he found out later that she hadn't been unfaithful to him. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> but he killed her anyhow. He was a mean guy. He killed his 18-year-old brother-in-law because the Jews liked the brother-in-law better than they liked him. So he killed him. He killed his wife's grandfather. And he killed his wife's 80-year-old uncle who at one time had saved Herod's life. But he had him killed. He killed his own uncle. He killed his mother-in-law. I won't go into that. <laughs> he was a mean guy. What's a few hundred babies to Herod? He's mean. The slaughter of innocent children in Bethlehem was a fulfillment of prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 31. Look at chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. What does this have to do with these two that are mentioned here? Ramah and Rachel. Well, Rachel was the wife of Jacob, as we know, and she lived in Bethlehem, and she was buried in Bethlehem. And so her descendants lived in Bethlehem, and they were some of those who were slaughtered during this time. And so the prophecy way back was Rachel weeping for her children. Some of her descendants were killed by Herod. And then it talks about Ramah here. Where is Ramah? Bethlehem was about five miles south of Jerusalem, and Ramah was about five miles north of Jerusalem. So what Herod did is he took a pencil, and he drew a circle around Jerusalem, five miles north, five miles west, five miles south, five miles east, a ten-mile diameter. And he killed all the babies two years and younger within that circle. Look at God's plan in verse 15. 
and and was there, they were there until the death of Herod, they were in Egypt until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophets, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. And that's found in Hosea. It had been God's plan all along for Jesus to go to Egypt. That seems kind of strange. The children of God, the Jews, were in Egypt. And 1,500 years earlier, Moses had led them out of Egypt. And now, God wants his son Jesus to go into Egypt to save his life. Now, Joseph and Mary wouldn't be alone in Egypt. We always think, okay, they went into Egypt, which was a strange land, and they were strangers in the land, but that's not exactly true, because by this time, Egypt was also under Roman rule, but Herod didn't have any power in Egypt. So thousands of Jews had fled from Israel, and they had gone into Egypt. And so when they went to Egypt, there were a lot of Jews there, probably some of them that they knew. Multiplied thousands of Jews who had fled to find safety and refuge from King Herod. The land that had once enslaved the Jews, now God is using to protect the Jews. Isn't God wonderful? Amen. He's protecting the Jews. Look at verse 19. Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Well, not long after this, King Herod died. And history tells us that before his death, he had a very painful and horrible disease. We don't know exactly what the disease was, but a very terrible, horrible disease. And knowing that he was about to die, old King Herod, the wicked man that he was, he ordered all of the Jewish nobility to be shut up in the Hippodrome and surrounded by soldiers. And he said that when word of his death comes, they were to be slaughtered. Why did he want to do this? Well, Herod wanted there to be weeping and wailing among the Jews when he died. And he knew that they wouldn't cry over the death of Herod, but he wanted to give them something to cry about. So he locked up these thousands of Jews in the Hippodrome and said, when I die, you go in and kill them. Then there will be weeping and there will be wailing. He wanted them to have a good reason to mourn. Well, he died. And the soldiers went into the Hippodrome. And they opened the doors and let all the Jews out. Didn't God good? They weren't killed. Joseph has another dream. And the angel speaks to him once again. Look in verse 20. Saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the young child's life are dead. Now Joseph gets God's okay to travel, to head back home, and God says go to Israel. Now Israel's a big place. Where in Israel? God doesn't say, he says just go to Israel. He's not given any specific location in Israel. Look in verse 21. Then he arose, you see Joseph is obedient, he immediately arose, he took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. He arose. No questions, no arguing, no problem. God says, go, get up, and go. God had protected them, and now they could return to Israel. You see, God didn't want his son to be brought up in Egypt. God had delivered them from Egypt 1,500 years before, and he didn't want his son raised in that heathen environment. Look in verse 22. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. Another dream. This makes the fourth dream. Now it talks about Judea and it talks about Galilee. Judea is where Bethlehem was located and Galilee is where Nazareth was located. Joseph had heard that Herod's son was on the throne and Archelaus was actually worse than his father Herod. Herod was an evil king. Archelaus was an evil, evil king. History tells us that one time there was a riot in Jerusalem and Archelaus just went in with his troops and killed everybody. Killed everybody who was rioting. One time he went to the temple on Passover. He went to the Jewish temple on Passover and he executed 3,000 Jews. 
at the Passover in the temple. And finally, after a while, Rome had enough and they banished him to what is now France, where he died. Look in verse 22. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. Now, Mary and Joseph, or Joseph and Mary, when they got to Judea, where Archelaus ruled, they were afraid to stay in that area for very long. So being warned by God in a dream, they headed north as fast as they could. And they went back home. They went to Nazareth. In verse 23. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. This also fulfilled a lot of prophecies in the Old Testament in Isaiah. Nazareth was a small town, just a town about the size of Newbury back then. Small town, and it was famous. But it was famous for not being famous. <laughs> there was nothing that really happened there. And it was famous for not being famous. A person could hide out there very easily in the city of Nazareth. It isn't even mentioned once in the Old Testament. And this is where God wanted his son to be raised. Now what can we learn from all of this? we got some lessons here. First of all, the safest place to be is where God leads you. Amen? The safest place to be is wherever God leads you. The wise men followed the star and it led them to the Christ child. Joseph followed the angel's instructions in a dream and God led them to escape into Egypt. Joseph followed God's instructions again in a dream and God led them safely back to Nazareth. The safest place you can be is in the center of the will of God. And if you go where God leads you, you'll always be under his care and protection. The safest place to be is wherever God leads you. Look at the second thing. Christians aren't exempt from troubles. Look at all the suffering that happened at the first Christmas. Suffering we normally don't think about and we don't talk about. The wise men had to avoid the wrath of King Herod. Joseph and Mary had to flee for their life and multitudes of innocent babies were killed because of the mad king. Now this was just a baby, but not just any baby. This was God's baby boy. This was Jesus, the Son of God. Now, why didn't God just get rid of King Herod? That would have solved a lot of problems, wouldn't it? But then you also might ask, why doesn't God just get rid of Satan? Satan's behind all of this. Why doesn't God just get rid of Satan? Good question. And the answer is, he will. He will. After all, it was Satan who was behind all this evil, just like he's behind all the evil in the world today. But look at what finally happened to King Herod. He died like the mad dog that he was. Look at what finally happened to King Archelaus. He died in exile. You see, in the end, God will win out. God is winning out every day. But in the end, God will win out. In the meantime, he always gives us the strength that we need to win every battle in our life. When we follow the path that God gives us. Christians aren't exempt from troubles. Number three, God is in charge. When you're living in God's will, you can always feel safe. That's not to say, say that bad things aren't going to happen to you, but God is in charge. God is always in charge. Everything that happened in the Christmas story and everything that happened in the post-Christmas blues, everything that happened was planned out by God. And you see his hand in all the Christmas story every step of the way. God was in charge and God is in charge. Joseph and Mary experienced post-Christmas blues. They didn't have their baby in Bethlehem. or They didn't have their baby there and then live happily ever after, as we think of some stories. Their dreams of going back to Nazareth to live a quiet and peaceful life was postponed for several years. Their life in Nazareth was nothing like they had planned, nothing like they had expected at all. 
they were experiencing post-Christmas blues. Maybe somebody here this morning is experiencing post-Christmas blues. Maybe your Christmas wasn't all that you had expected it to be. Maybe because of some tragedy in your life, this Christmas hasn't been the most joyous of occasions. You know, for some people, joyous is, uh, uh, Christmas is not a joyous time. For some people, it's not a happy time because of something that happened in the past around Christmas time. Now that Christmas is over, maybe the excitement has passed. Maybe your balloon has burst. But guess what? God is still in charge. He didn't leave Joseph and Mary in Bethlehem to go it alone. He didn't leave them in Egypt to tough it out. God is still on the throne. He's still in charge. Things didn't always happen the way people had planned for them to happen. God was in charge on this first Christmas, and God still is in charge today. And let's not forget this valuable lesson of Christmas. Have faith. Have faith in God. That's going to be our invitation in this morning. Have faith in God. Have faith in a very strong God, in a very loving God, in a very powerful God, in a very saving God. Have faith in God. You know, you're only safe if you're in the will of God. And to be in the will of God means to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. And if you haven't trusted Christ as your Savior, you're not in the will of God. You might be living a good life. You might be living a happy life. You might be living a moral life. But if you've never trusted Jesus to save you, you're not in the will of God. Have faith in God. Trust in the God who can provide eternal life and salvation for us all. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the blessing of Christmas. We thank you for the blessings of post-Christmas. We thank you that we can call upon you in times of trouble because you don't exempt us from problems and troubles and trials. But Father, you're always there. And you're always in charge. And you always will give us the peace and the comfort and the safety that we need. We thank you for being our Savior. We thank you, Father, for sending your Son, Jesus. And Jesus, we thank you for coming to this earth to provide salvation for us. And we give you the praise for this in Jesus' name. Amen.